Welcome back. Uh, the last speaker of this morning's session is a very colorful physicist, Professor Joseph Samuel, professor at the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. Professor Samuel has worked on a wide variety of things, all related to quantum mechanics in one way or another, but also some related to the formulation of generativity using the variables of Abhay Ashtekar. He's really well known for his work on Pancharatnam phases using the language of quantum mechanics. Pancharatnam phases, of course, is something which we are all proud of, happened here in this city. And, uh, and as you can see from the title of his talk, he also works by analogy, huge analogies leading to fantastic connections in physics. So without further ado, Professor Samuel, our Sam, speak on the universe as a soap film. So first I'd like to thank the organizers and TRG for inviting me to this, uh, this meeting to honor Chandrasekhar, and, uh, who was, as we all know, a great astrophysicist, a scholar, and a gentleman of the old school. And I think consistent with his attitudes in these matters, I will pay my tribute to him by directly starting my talk. So as you can guess, my, well, my title is the universe is a soap film. As you can guess from the title, I'm trying to draw analogies between gravitation and condensed matter physics. Now, physics thrives on analogies. We all know that. And analogies are always useful, though never perfect. There's always some difference between the two fields that you're trying to relate. And that is also true in this case. So this is work done in collaboration with Supurna Sena and Rohit Kati, who is a visiting student from, from Bangalore University. And Supurna Sena is a soft matter physicist. So that's the interface between gravitation and soft matter physics, which I'm talking about today. Now, I'm going to start from the very beginning. And well, Another way of, uh, another subtitle to this talk, which could have been, I could have replaced this title by another one with a slightly flippant mode. It can be also called quantum gravity in a bathtub. <laughs> so I'm going to now take you back a long way to a gentleman called Archimedes who did some of his best science in a bathtub. And it, this is one of the first scientific papers ever written. So it's probably the first attempt at astrophysics. What he's trying to do is ask, how big is the universe? And can we quantify how big it is? At the time when Archimedes lived, the number system was not as well developed as it is now. So it was a great intellectual feat. He asked, how many grains of sand are there in the universe? Well, for that, you need to know how big the universe is and how small a grain of sand is. And this was done about 250 years before Christ. It's the first example of someone grappling with the large numbers which are needed to describe our universe. So he took the size of the universe to be roughly twice the size of what we know as the solar system today, and the size of a grain of sand to be one hundredth of a poppy seed. From this you can calculate, and he arrived at this number, and in fact along the way he had to develop some new mathematics. I'll skip over all that. I mean, basically, he had to invent place notation, and he used the largest known number at the time as the myriad, as the base. Now, if you take this question and modernize it, let's ask the same question again that Archimedes asked in those days. You should replace the spatial volume of the universe by its space-time fold volume. That's a natural change to make. You should also replace the grain of sand by the smallest thing that we know of. And we know of atoms, we know of quarks, but we know that there are things much smaller than that. The smallest thing you can think of now, because of our theories of gravitation, quantum mechanics, and relativity, is around the Planck Ford volume of 10 to the minus 132. Now, maybe I'll just pause a minute to explain these numbers. So, because there are a lot of students in the audience, and I noticed many of them did not know 
this dimensional analysis. Can I have the lights, please? Lights. Yeah. So if you take a mass m, particle physicists will tell you that mass can be measured in inverse lengths. So you can construct a Compton wavelength from the mass, which is given by h bar over mc. Now this, community, uh, this problem of quantum gravity has two people with opposite attitudes working in it. One set of people will tell you that mass is inverse of length, and those are the people who come from particle physics, the quantum physicists. There's another set of people who try to think of matter as geometry, and they will measure mass in geometric units. They will also produce a length. If you put these two lengths together, equate them dimensionally, you arrive at a preferred mass, which I call m star, which is called the Planck mass. And that turns out to be about 10 to the minus 5 grams. Or if you convert it into energies, it's 10 to the 19 GeV. And if you convert the Planck mass into a length, you arrive at a tiny length scale, which is 10 to the 35 meters. That's the Planck length. So that's the length at which theories of quantum gravity become relevant. It's good to keep the broad dimensional analysis in mind. Now, I can do without the lights now. So if you take this number, the fourth volume of the universe, which has been measured by Hubble, and divided by the Planck fourth volume, you arrive at an astronomical number. Uh, the number is 10 to the power of 244. We've been seeing a lot of large numbers in the last few days. This is another example of them. This number I'm going to call Archimedes' number, because it's the answer to the question that Archimedes asked. How many grains of sand are there in the universe? I've just changed the definitions of the universe and the definition of the grain of sand. But this n Archimedes is a huge number. Dirac suggested that large numbers are unnatural in cosmology, and that when, whenever we find large numbers, we should try to relate them so, so as to decrease the number of independent ones. Once you, that's, that is the suggestion that Dirac made a long time ago. In the last decade, there have been detailed observations of dim and distant supernovae, which clearly indicate the presence of a tiny but non-zero cosmological constant lambda. So here's a very tiny number in cosmology. And one can argue that tiny small numbers in cosmology are as unnatural as large numbers, because the inverse of a small number is a large number. So can one relate these two large numbers, the inverse of the cosmological constant and Archimedes' number? Is it possible? And this is precisely what was done by Raphael Sorkin. Sorkin argued that quantum gravity would predict an order of magnitude for fluctuations in the cosmological constant, which in natural units is 1 by root n. Now, 1 by root n is a very common kind of unit for fluctuations. Every time you have n discrete objects, you get root n fluctuations. Everybody knows this. Astrophysicists know it very well. Astronomers know it even better. And physicists in Brownian motion also know this. So this proposal of Sorkin was made in the context of a particular approach to quantum gravity, which is not the most popular one, but that's where it was originally made. So what I'm going to suggest today is by using, it's one of several approaches, and in fact, it's not the most popular one. I'm going to set up an analogy between GR and soft condensed matter and argue that this is a generic prediction of quantum gravity effects, that it's not thing special to cause it. It should be there in all approaches. Now, there are several approaches to quantum gravity. And we heard about the string framework. That's what we should call it from now onwards. So string framework is one approach to quantum gravity. There is also loop quantum gravity. And there are a few others which are not as well known. Causets is one. There are other people who use non-commutative geometry. Some have violations of local Lorentz invariance, but all have discreteness in some form. The precise form of the discreteness varies from theory to theory. But this is a common element of all ap approaches to quantum gravity. And in fact, the fact that the black hole entropy is finite comes fun fundamentally because of this, this discreteness. You take the area and measure it in Planck areas, area of the black hole, measured in Planck areas. This analogy suggests that, well, let us switch from astrophysics and the universe to the laboratory, where there's another large number, 
Avogadro's number. And his number is 10 to the power of 23. So if you write it out, it would have 23 digits. Pretty long, pretty hard to call up Avogadro on your mobile phone. So that's a large number in the laboratory. It's not as large as the Archimedes number, but still it's huge. So the inverse of a large number is very small. One by Avogadro's number is tiny. And it's impossible to think of detecting atoms directly, because one atom is so tiny. But 1 by square root of n is not quite as small. And in fact, this is the principle that gives rise to Brownian motion. You can put in a micron-sized bead in a solution, and because of the imperfect cancellations of the parts, you find that the bead executes Brownian motion, and it's plainly visible under an optical microscope. So because of this square root, you've managed to tame an extremely large number and bring it down to size. So Brownian motion was actually discovered by a Dutch physicist called Jan Ingenhaus many years before Brown. But it was popularized by Brown. And finally, Einstein gave the explanation in terms of atomic physics. And I'm sorry? Yeah, he, that's true, because he's in green. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, but the Dutch have a very good tradition of, uh, of this kind of science. Anyway, yeah. So, the question I'm asking today is, can the cosmological constant be today's Brownian motion? The fact that lambda is small but non-zero, I'm trying to suggest, is similar to Brownian motion, that we're actually seeing quantum gravity effects on a very macroscopic scale. This is far-fetched and audacious, but just bear with me. I would like you to willingly suspend your disbelief for about an hour. And it would also help if you just forget all the quantum gravity you know, loop quantum gravity, all the string framework. And if you just, uh, you know, if you go by the, the, the spectacles that I'm trying to provide on this subject, of course, you can remember it all again after the talk. What I will show is that Sorkin's suggestion can be better understood using an analogy from soft condensed matter, the physics of fluid membranes. I'll develop an analogy between the cosmological constant and the surface tension of membranes. What makes the universe expand accelerate rather, is the cosmological constant. And what makes dewdrops round is the surface tension of membranes. I'm going to suggest that there is a connection between these two things. And that will bring the subject down to Earth and into the laboratory, perhaps into the bathtub. What I find mainly, the main conclusion is that the cosmological constant, which is fluctuating, is more general than the context of cosets. And all models of quantum gravity will actually have something like this. What I do in this talk is to develop the analogy and its consequences. It's all on the archive and published. Let's start by reviewing the cosmological constant problem in GR. A space-time is the pair of a four manifold and a metric. It's a set of all events, and they form a four-dimensional continuum. G is a Lorentzian metric, and this is a history. I think in David Gross's talk also, there was exactly this use of the word history yesterday. So what I mean by this is that it's a space-time all laid out. It's, it's all of history laid out on a sheet on a four-dimensional manifold. The dynamics of pure gravity is described by the Einstein-Hilbert action. And usually as an afterthought, one adds a cosmological term, which is this one. The classical equations of motion emerge by extremizing the sum of these two actions. These are some coefficients, C2 and C, C0. In standard notation, those coefficients are given by these numbers, lambda and 1 over 16 pi Newton's constants. Usually, the higher derivative terms, like this one, are dropped as being negligible at low energies. Now, this is entirely in the spirit of effective field theory, or what we call Landau theory in condensed matter physics. Landau takes a top-down approach towards condensed matter physics. And I can best illustrate this by the example of superconductivity. There's a microscopic model that comes from Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. They try to tell you what the electrons are doing. There's a microscopic model that comes from Lando and Ginzburg. What they say is that we don't care what's happening at the bottom. I'm going to start at the top and just understand what's going on in terms of general symmetry principles and order parameters. Let's take that attitude towards GR. We really don't know what is the microscopic theory. This metric is a field, which is like the order parameter, and that is an action which I'm just going to write down and do an expansion in powers of derivatives. 
So the higher derivative terms are irrelevant and the lower derivative terms are more relevant. If you were to consistently apply this logic, you expect that the low energy physics of gravity to be dominated by the I naught term, the cosmological constant term. However, and in fact, a crude dimensional analysis would suggest that in Planck units, lambda should be of order one. The observed value of lambda is almost is zero. But it's not exactly zero. We have the observed value to be 10 to the power of minus 122 in Planck units. It's tiny but non zero. So the cosmological pro constant problem is a dilemma with two horns. First part is why is the cosmological constant nearly zero? And why, if it is so small, does it vanish entirely? It's hard to come up with a natural explanation for both these facts because the two parts are going against each other. If you come up with a very good reason why it is zero, you will then have to explain why it's not zero. For example, symmetry could imply Yesterday, we heard about supersymmetry implying vanishing cosmological constant. So you might be able to invoke a symmetry which suggests that lambda is exactly equal to 0. But then why is it only approximately 0? You would have to break that symmetry somewhere and come up with a tiny value. So this is the same problem that confronted the wise men in Brobdingnag in the story of Gulliver's travels. If you remember, Gulliver was found in a field by a farmer. And at some point, he found his way to court. And then the learned men were asked to explain why he was so small in relation to the giants who lived in that area. So if there was no Gulliver, there would be nothing to explain. But the hard part is to explain why he was there and he is so small. So that's the same problem we're dealing with today. The idea that Sorkin had, I think, is really beautiful, is that quantum gravity may provide a natural explanation stemming from the fundamental discreteness of space-time. And I've said this before, it's in a framework of rather unpopular theories. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it in a, in a disparaging tone. These are not theories which have got wide currency today. In causal sets, you replace space-time by a discrete structure. These are just points with causal relations. The number of points give you the volume of space-time. And the rest of the metrical information is captured in causal relations. And space-time is an emergent notion as you get to very large volumes. This four volume of space-time also plays a role in unimodular gravity. The metric field is subject to a constraint like this. In fact, this theory was first considered by Einstein and later Weinberg and Andrew Wald. It's, a, it's basically a GR with a constraint of a fixed four volume. It's classically equivalent to general relativity with the cosmological constant. But the difference between these two theories is that here, lambda is a dynamical variable, unlike in GR, where it's a coupling constant. Sorkin has nothing to say about part A of the cosmological constant problem. He's not telling you why the cosmological constant vanishes. So let's assume that somebody else has given a good reason for that. Now he's going to address only part B of the problem. Suppose A has been solved and the expectation value of lambda is 0. The argument is that there will be fluctuations about this mean value, which give a small cosmological constant. He predicted in 1990 the right order of magnitude. And if you just use the uncertainty relation between lambda and the four volume, you find that the fluctuations must be of this order, which is exactly the right order of magnitude which has been observed. So in some ways, this vindicates, well, this goes back to Dirac's large number hypothesis. If this mechanism is correct, we have been able to relate two large numbers. This prediction is consistent with astronomical data which has been, has been collected over the last decade, redshift luminosity relations for supernovae. And there's a lot of other evidence that suggests that the universe is accelerating at the present epoch, indicating a small but positive cosmological constant. Now, Sorkin does not predict the sign. He only predicts the order, order of magnitude. It's also delta lambda. Yes, that's right. Yes. So we'll come to that, yes. So now let's get to the analogy. In fact, the main thrust of my talk is the analogy. And then what we will find is that using the analogy, you can go back and forth between two different fields. So in soft matter physics, what do I mean by soft matter? 
Soft matter is basically entropy dominated matter where the effects of quantum mechanics are negligible. That's the theoretical physicist definition of soft matter. I can put h bar to zero. So there are no quantum effects. All the effects are due to thermal fluctuations. Let's now describe a membrane. A configuration of a membrane is described as a 2D surface, sigma, embedded in flat three-dimensional space. For example, there could be a membrane right here. This has got a curvature which is extrinsic and also an intrinsic curvature. Dimensionally, the extrinsic curvature goes as 1 upon length and the intrinsic, so, yeah, the intrinsic curvature goes as 1 by L squared. This is the Gaussian curvature. We need to write down an energy function to tell you how the membrane behaves as a statistical system. I'm going to assume with Landau, well, uh, that, that it's got some certain symmetries, just to illustrate Landau's point. Assume that sigma is two-sided and has symmetry between its two sides. Here are the terms you can write down. The first term you can write down is proportional to the area of the membrane. This is the metric on the, on the surface. If you integrate that, you get the energy. This is some coefficient. The next term you can write down has got curvatures. This is the extrinsic curvature. That's the intrinsic curvature. The leading term for the dynamics of membranes is the surface tension. And the cur curvature terms are higher order. Normally, one writes sigma for the surface tension. Higher derivative terms like this are negligible in the long wavelength limit. So let's forget about them. This is entirely in the spirit of Landau's theory. I know that the actual membrane is composed of lots of other physics. I'm not interested. I just look at the membrane, its surface, and take the low energy limit and describe it. The partition function, defined as a sum over all configurations of the Boltzmann weight, will tell you everything you want to know about the motion of the membrane at macroscopic scales, where this is an expansion. If you give up the symmetry between the two sides of the membrane, you could have had a term like this. And that's an example of how symmetry can be used to throw out terms. So I will assume symmetry and throw out such a term. Now, the mathematical model of a membrane can be realized physically as an interface between two fluids. If you look at a dewdrop in the morning sun, the fluid outside is air and inside is water. And the surface tension is actually what makes the dewdrop look round. It's slightly distorted due to gravity. That's a combination of two energies. There's a very clear analogy between the GR and the soft matter situations based on the usual correspondence between quantum physics and statistical physics. This is a very well-known correspondence that quantum physics relies on e to the power of minus iht and stat phys relies on e to the minus beta h. A history in quantum physics is replaced by a configuration a sum over history is replaced by a sum over configurations, action in quantum physics by the energy, and Planck's constant, which comes here under the action, is replaced by the temperature. So thermal fluctuations are entirely replaced by quantum fluctuations. That's the picture. The energy cost for making a unit area of surface is what we call the surface tension. And if when you're shampooing your hair, you would take the shampoo and work it up with your fingers. You're doing mechanical work to create surface. And that's exactly what the surface tension is. Energy cost per unit area of surface. The same thing happens when you beat up an egg. You create the surface by doing mechanical work. Similarly here, the cosmological constant is the action cost per four volume of space time. Um, you see, uh, the, this, this is, everything in red is about space time. The membrane is in two dimensions, and the action cost per unit area of energy cost per unit area of space time is what I call the surface tension. If I want to increase the, the, the area by one unit of area, I have to put in that much energy, the surface tension. I'm sorry? Which, no, no, which is like bulk modulus? No, action cost per unit volume of space time, I would, I mean, I would just leave it like that, no? Yeah. It's not a material property yet, let's, yeah. I'm just right now doing geometry of membranes compared to geometry of space time. So let's set up a table of analogy. It's good to have a dictionary to, that relates physics on one side. This is the soft matter side, and this is the GR side. Here, membranes, and here's the universe. A configuration here maps to a history on this side. 
area of a configuration is the four volume of a history, sum over configurations is the sum over histories, energy of a configuration maps to the sum, uh, classical action here. The first term that you would have thought of writing down is the area of the membrane that maps to the four volume of space time. The second term is the curvature squared energy and that is similar to the Einstein action. The partition function here which is what will tell you the thermodynamic properties of membranes maps to the quantum action. I mean basically this is a quantum propagator that we would love to evaluate but we do not know how to do it. It is a sum over all configurations of the action as a function of history, sum over all histories divided by Planck's constant. Now if I were to minimize what is in the exponent here or there, here I get the minimum energy configuration that is the unperturbed membrane, the membrane in the lowest energy configuration. Here you get the classical path of least action which is the classical solution which describes Einstein's equations and, the, and GR. The temperature here is the Planck's constant there, thermal fluctuations in this side are replaced by quantum fluctuations and most importantly the surface tension is replaced by the cosmological constant. If you take logs on both sides you get the free energy here which is also called the effective action there which gives you quantum connections to the Einstein equations of motion. And uh, yeah, pr probably I should interject to say that condensed matter analogies of fundamental physics are quite old. They have been happening a long, for a long time. And even yesterday we heard in Abai's talk that he was using the word polymer, which is an idea from condensed matter physics. And also things like lattices, which are basically borrowed from condensed matter. The idea of discreteness of, of the underlying objects. Many of these ideas flow back and forth between fundamental physics and advanced physics and, and, uh, and uh, laboratory physics. Now let us start facing the fact that the geometric description of a membrane as a smooth two manifold is only a mathematical idealization and a real membrane is composed of molecules. This is saying that it is not really as pretty as all that, let us get down to what is really there. This is similar to the breakdown of the smooth manifold picture of space time at the Planck scale. When you get to the Planck scale we can no longer pretend that we have a four, smooth four dimensional manifold. Let us face it. So the molecular length which is for most molecules about 0.3 nanometers is being thought of as like the Planck length. At mesoscopic scales or microns the membrane appears smooth and in a statistical sense it is locally homogeneous and isotropic. So if I take a soap film I will not notice the discrete structure of the microscopic or the molecular structure. That is the same as saying that even in particle physics in a laboratory when you do scattering experiments you will not notice the Planck scale discreteness of space time. And it appears lo local, locally Lorentz invariant even though it may be grainy at the Planck scale and most quantum gravity models have this graininess built in in some way or the other. For example, in the string framework, not the string theory anymore, but the string framework, they have dualities that relate, relate sub Planckian scales to super Planckian scales. In loop quantum gravity, you can see there are spin networks, which are also discrete objects, which are at the Planck scale. You can do estimates of the possibility of suddenly finding a void, they are negligibly small, and similarly, I won't go over this in any length, it is just saying that you will statistically expect to recover either rotational invariance in the membrane or Lorentz invariance in space time. So I have just extended the table of analogy, here was all the stuff I had before, in red I have added a few things, these talk about the breakdown of the smooth mathematical picture and the more realistic picture, the molecular length replacing the Planck length, molecules repre replacing causate elements. And to be more general, these are not causate elements, I could think of them as atoms of space time and they are present in every approach to quantum gravity. The molecular level discreteness of space is here the Planck scale discreteness of space time. Now I said at the beginning that all analogies have their limitations and it is good to be aware of the limitations of the analogy. Let me also say that 
even from the limitations of analogy, you can learn something. So I'm actually going to exploit the analogy, push it as far as it goes, and learn both from its strengths and its weaknesses. So the main differences are of dimension and of signature. Membranes are two-dimensional. The universe is four-dimensional. This deals with Euclidean geometries. That deals with Lorentzian geometries. As a result, a positive surface tension tends to minimize the area. So if you take a soap film, you take a wire and dip it in soap film and hold it out, it will form a minimal surface, a surface of minimal area. That is the solution of the classical equations of motion that tell you that the, the system likes to minimize its energy. On the other hand, for precisely the same reason, because the, the signature is different, a positive lambda causes accelerated expansion of the universe in Einstein's equations. It's exactly the same kind of term, but because of the difference of the signature, positive lambda actually causes accelerated expansion of the universe rather than shrinking it. There's no causal structure here. There is a causal structure here. In membranes, there is an ambient space and an extrinsic geometry, whereas in GR, it's one of the principles of GR that we do not make any reference to extrinsic space. We talk only intrinsically. What is uh, ambient space is the space in which the membrane is moving. Yeah. So the universe is not living in any ambient space, but the membrane is. I'm sorry? I, I didn't drop it. I, I dropped the K term because it's topological. Yeah. So the, there are two terms which are of the same uh, dimension. I can either write the extrinsic curvature squared or the Gaussian curvature term. And they both come in the same place. But the second one is topological. So for a moment, we can drop it. Yeah. It's OK. It, you can keep it if you want. I'm not going to do anything with it. But let's say both the terms are there. Now. Here, there's an important difference that you have a very mathematically well-defined, exponentially damped sum over configurations in statistical physics. You have a mathematically ill-defined oscillatory sum over histories in the spirit of Feynman. And this is an important difference. Here, you have a non-Poisson distribution of molecules. Because the molecules interact with each other, they're not distributed in any Poisson fashion. Whereas here, you have, a, according to Raphael Sorkin's program, you must have a Poisson distribution of causal elements. This is going to show up again later, so just remember that. That's an important difference. Using the analogy, we would expect that the surface tension of a membrane should be of order 1 in dimensionless units. And if you use the table that we had before, the unit of energy is kBT. That's like h bar being the unit of action. And a typical Planck scale is of order the molecular length squared. This has got the dimensions of energy per unit area. So this is what you would expect the average surface tension of any membrane to be if it's composed of molecules. Let's suppose that you, for some reason, choose to set the surface tension to 0 by hand in the microscopic energy. Even if you do that, such a term is generated by thermal fluctuations. The argument is very simple. The flat membrane will vibrate about its equilibrium configuration, just like a drum vibrates because of thermal fluctuations. Equipartition will tell us that there is an energy of kT in every mode. And then the sum over modes is divergent. You have to regulate the sum over modes by putting a cutoff, which is given by 2 pi over the molecular length scale. And when you do this integral, kBT for every mode, sum over mode, you find that you end up with an effective energy which is kT upon L molecular length squared. So this much surface tension will show up no matter what you do. That is what you would expect. This is very similar to the argument that tells you that the cosmological constant should be of order 1 in Planck units. Whether you put it there or not, renormalization will generate it. Surface tension is generated by thermal fluctuations. And in fact, this is the standard value that you would expect. It's about 1 40th of an electron volt for room temperature. So you would naively expect that the surface tension of membranes is about 40 millijoules per meter squared. And in fact, this expectation turns out to be correct. If you look at many standard interfaces, 
you find that water vapor, I mean, these are the numbers. They're all of order 40. 40 is like roughly the same as all the others. So there are some exceptions. For example, if you take big molecules, you find that the surface tension goes down. But that's, again, consistent with increasing the size of the molecular egg scale to bring down the surface tension. And similarly, if you put in soap, you find you change the order of magnitude. You don't change the order of magnitude, but you decrease the surface tension of water air interface by one third. So there's no cosmological constant problem in laboratory physics, it looks like. Because all these membranes have the right order of magnitude for the surface tension. This tells you that the surface, that the dimensional argument is probably correct. But there's an important exception, and that's what I want to talk about. And that exception is fluid membranes. These are characterized by a negligibly small surface tension, orders of magnitude below the dimensional expectation. So this is just like the cosmological constant problem. We don't know why it's so low. If you ask a soft matter physicist, and if Gautam Menon is here, you can ask him. He will tell you that the surface tension of a fluid membrane is exactly zero. Experimental physicists will only produce upper bounds. Nobody will give you a number for this uh, surface tension. The statistical mechanics of tensionless membranes is dominated by E2. That is the analog of the Einstein, the, it's the curvature term, rather than E0. And this is the exact counterpart to the cosmological constant problem. So this is an example where part A of the cosmological constant problem is naturally solved. And there's clearly something to understand in cosmology. If such a humble system as a fluid membrane can do it, maybe we can learn how to do it in cosmology. Yeah, I'm going to describe that, yes, yeah. Uh, so we need to understand what a fluid membrane is uh, and why they have such small surface tension. It's basically composed of a kind of molecule which is amphiphilic. So amphiphilic molecules have got a polar head which likes water and a hydrocarbon tail which dislikes water. So if you put this, these kinds of molecules into water, they tend to cluster to hide their tails from the water. And they form all kinds of structures, micelles, vesicles, and symmetric bilayers. There's a whole rich phase diagram here. And in fact, the cell membrane, our, the cells of our body are protected by a lipid membrane, which is of this kind. That does not have zero surface tension. Let me explain that. So this is what a fluid membrane looks like. This is a bilayer. It has got all the heads in contact with water, the tails away from water. And you can see the whiteness where the water has been excluded. So this whole object, if you just put in a bunch of molecules, they will form all these structures. Some will, not, some will be just wandering around, but the others will be in the bilayers. Now, if you let this bilayer relax to a tension, I mean, just let it relax. Do nothing to it. Don't put any stress on it. It will relax to a tensionless state. It will minimize its energy. And the argument is very simple. If you think of the free energy, you can talk about the area per molecule. Take the total area divided by the number of molecules. And this has got a certain optimal value. Like if you push the molecules too close together, they repel each other. If you push it far away, it's, once again, it's not energetically favorable. There's an optimal distance, which is dictated by the Van der Waal forces, that, that tells you how much area should be there for a molecule. Now, in, a membrane, if you just leave it alone, it'll adjust its area so that the optimal density is achieved. In other words, this condition will be satisfied. So if you take a membrane with a fixed number of molecules, you find that the expectation value of the surface tension actually vanishes. So this is the argument, standard argument given in the theory of fluid membranes to explain why they have so, uh, so small a tension. So this solves part A of the, of the analog of the cosmological constant problem. This is the mechanism, which is very mundane, actually. The physical explanation is, as you force, if you try to force the membrane to expand, you create gaps. And these are quickly filled in by molecules from the solution. The chemical potential difference is zero at equilibrium, so it costs no energy cost. So it costs no energy to stretch the membrane, and there's no surface tension. So here you think of the surface tension as being like a chemical potential for creating more of the membrane. What about part B? Can we do anything there? Part B can also address the surface tension has fluctuations about its mean value. So if I take the variance and compute that, you find that you get uh, a small calculation using this simple theory. You find that the fluctuations in the surface tension 
will go as 1 upon square root of n. This is from theory. This is the standard value you would expect. And as the membrane goes to infinity, you expect these fluctuations to die out in the thermodynamic limit. But at, for a finite size membrane, you expect to find this much fluctuations. Now, this is in complete analogy to Sorkin's proposal. Now, this effect is hardly a new effect. It's a standard statistical mechanics effect. If you consider any system with an entropy which depends on some parameters, you can expand the entropy about to its maximum. And you'll find, because it's a maximum, that there's no linear term in the Taylor expansion. And there's a quadratic term of definite sign. And you find that the system spontaneously makes fluctuations to states of lower entropy and comes back. So this is exactly the reason for surface tension fluctuations. The mean square fluctuations of intensive quantities go as 1 over n. And this is in Landau Lipschitz. And an example of such an effect is Brownian motion. It's an observable effect. And this has to do with fluctuations of mesoscopic systems. So we can actually see the effects of molecular size physics, not at the level of molecules, but at much larger scales. Similarly, I'm suggesting that you can see the effects of Planck, not at the Planck scale, where we cannot reach an energy, but at a much larger scale, like at the universal scale. So this is an experiment that we uh, actually propose to measure this fluctuating surface tension. I will not spend any time on it, because the experiment has not been done. Instead of doing the experiment, uh, which is slightly impractical in a lab, because you need very small size membranes, and you have to interest an experimenter in this, the obvious thing to do is to try simulations. That is, you make this whole system on a computer, and you run it using Newton's equations. So we did that. And oops. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we did that using some. Yeah, so what is plotted here is the surface tension as a function of the area per molecule. And you find that no matter how many lipids you put in, how many molecules you put in, you find that they all fall on the same curve. This is roughly telling you that the free energy is extensive in the number of molecules. So this is basically checking the simple theory that we are talking about. And the next one is a plot of the surface tension fluctuations as a function of the number of lipids. And you find that it goes down as 1 by square root of n. The actual number is 0.48, which is roughly like 1 by square root of n. This is what you expect from theory. And actually, we use software that was actually developed by Maddalena Ventroli, the soft condensed matter physicist who does much more realistic simulations. So we didn't write the code ourselves. We just ran it. So now let me start to conclude. And I'm trying to learn what I can about the gravity side from here. I described the cosmological constant problem and Sorkin's quantum gravity explanation for it, developed an analogy between surface tension and the cosmological constant. It's based on the standard mapping between quantum field theory and statistical mechanics. Then I noticed that dimensional arguments worked, work well for the surface tension of most interfaces. That's the analog of the cosmological constant problem in soft condensed matter physics. So translated pretty exotic physics of the cosmological constant into known physics, and what might even be laboratory physics a few years down the line. Suggested an experiment for measuring this fluctuating surface tension. And the main point, really, is that you can relate two completely disparate fields. One has to do with the universe. One has to do with membranes. And the analogy is not physical, but mathematical. So that the reason it's mathematical, uh, precisely because it's mathematical, you're able to relate completely different things. If it was physical, you would only be able to relate like things to like things. So part A of the cosmological constant problem is discussed in fluid membranes, but not in cosmology. And part B is the other way around. So clearly, we can export wisdom from one field to the other. Sorkin suggested, Sorkin's suggestion was made in the context of causets and unimodular gravity. So how essential are these inputs? What we would like to know is how is, what is really needed. Can we develop a minimalist picture? 
What seems essential is dynamical lambda. Otherwise, you will not be able to have a fluctuation. So that seems to come from unimodular gravity. And another thing which is essential is discrete space-time. You must have some discrete object so that you can talk about 1 by square root of n fluctuations. So let's consider these in turn. Yes, yes. I'll, I'll be done. In GR, lambda is a fixed coupling constant, and so there are no fluctuations. Consider the soft matter context. For a membrane with this tension, you would have a partition function that looks like this. Now, this is what I would call this constant surface tension ensemble. In statistical mechanics, I know that I can do an experiment in many different ways. I can either hold the volume constant and measure the pressure, or hold the pressure constant and measure the volume. Both kinds of experiments can be done and have been done. So this is what I would call the constant surface tension example. But we can equally well do the same experiment in the constant area ensemble. Suppose I have a method of fixing the area of the surface of the membrane and then asking what is the corresponding surface tension. These two descriptions are just a Laplace transform of away from each other. Both can be realized in the laboratory. Thermodynamically, it's a Legendre transform. And if you were to do it in statistical physics, it would actually be a Laplace transform. This discussion translates easily to the gravity context, where the Laplace transform is replaced by a Fourier transform because of the I. In a quantum version of gravity, there's no reason to treat lambda as a coupling constant whose value is eternally fixed. Instead, we should think of this lambda as a chemical pot potential that's conjugate to the Ford volume and enlarge our idea of GR to include all possible four volumes. That is, we should be able to talk about not just constant four volume, uh, constant lambda ensemble, but also constant, the, the conjugate ensemble, in which lambda is also allowed to fluctuate. So unimodular gravity is actually a close cousin of GR, which has, let's say, a poor cousin of GR, which has been neglected. And in this age of the renormalization group and the running coupling constant, one should not really think of lambda just as a fixed number for all eternity. One should think of it as a chemical potential. And like all chemical potentials, it's subject to fluctuations. So it is dynamical in that sense. I'm not suggesting that you write equation, write, add a term in the Lagrangian so that including the derivatives of lambda as, in fact, in the private discussion with Abai that came up. What I'm suggesting is that this should be regarded as something like the pressure in thermodynamics. And pressures do fluctuate for finite systems. For very large systems, the fluctuations die out. To, su to summarize, unimodular gravity is not an essential input to Sorkin's idea. Rather, GR and unimodular gravity are related theories. And it's there. If you start doing GR in a quantum sense, you will be doing unimodular gravity as well. What about discrete space-time? This aspect is supplied by causets, but more generically, any quantum gravity approach also has this. Yet, if you look at Sorkin's argument, it looks like there's a particular need for the Poisson nature of the number fluctuations. For a Poisson distribution, the variance delta n is proportional to square root of n. The variation is proportional, I mean, proportional to the mean. That's exactly true for Poisson fluctuations. But now, let's put on this other hat and look at it from the condensed matter end. In condensed matter, we do not have Poisson distributions. And yet, we have square root of n fluctuations. So that would suggest that Poisson fluctuations are not absolutely essential. So the resolution is simply that when n gets large, the central limit theorem assures us that root n fluctuations are there. It's quite independent of Poisson. You don't need Poisson. If you have Poisson, you find that delta n is exactly equal to square root of n. But even otherwise, for large n, it will be approximately true. So even without Poisson stat statistics and all that stuff in causets, you can, you, can be comfortable, you can be assured that this number is large enough that you can forget about Poisson statistics and still have square root of n fluctuations. So the conclusion is that Poisson statistics is not essential for for Sorkin's idea. 
So we conclude that we will have quantum fluctuations in the cosmological constant in any approach to quantum gravity which has discreteness of space-time and which enlarges its notion of lambda. Now this is both good and bad news. It is bad because in some sense the ex experiment does not seem to discriminate between competing theories. It seems a generic thing. On the other hand, it is also good because we'd we may now have a general quantum gravity explanation for the cosmological constant problem. Most other ways of explaining this problem uh, suffer from fine tuning of some kind or the other. And this seems relatively better from, I, I believe it does. Sorkin's idea solved part B. The cosmological constant is zero, as close to zero as it can be given quantum gravity fluctuations. In other words, we had these two parts. Why is it zero and why is it non-zero? So the answer after this is that it is as close to zero as it can be given quantum uncertainties. Yeah? So at least part of the problem is solved. Now, what about part A? Why is it nearly zero? The analog system suggests an explanation along the following lines. The cosmological constant is a low energy residue resulting from an imperfect cancellation between high energy processes. There are many instances of this happening in physics. Even yesterday in Gross's talk, he emphasized that we, we feel gravity, the weakest force, precisely because it's so weak. All the strong forces tend to catch, cancel each other out. So if you put together ions in a gas, they form atoms, and it's only the Van der Waals forces that remain. And similarly, quarks are so strongly attracted to each other that they confine, and the nuclear forces are a low energy residual force. Maybe there is some explanation which would need an actual quantum gravity model along these lines that tells you that the strongest forces are actually the weakest at the end of it. So that's where the cosmological constant is tending towards zero. Now, I can't express this idea better than Sir Isaac Newton, whom Chandrasekhar admired very much. And he spent a, quite a lot of his time trying to expound his writings. So somewhere in this book, Optics, which is misspelled by Newton because he didn't know any better, he says, there are therefore agents in nature able to make the particles of bodies stick together by very strong attractions. And it's the business of experimental philosophy to find them out. Now, the smallest particles of matter by cohere by the strongest attractions and compose bigger particles of a weak, weaker virtue. And many of these may cohere and compose bigger particles whose virtue is weaker still. And so on for diverse successions until the progression end in the biggest particles on which the operations in chemistry and the colors of natural bodies depend, and which by cohering compose bodies of sensible magnitude. What he's talking about is the fact that when you get to larger and larger scales, different forces become more and more relevant. He seems to be talking about running coupling constants. Perhaps the explanation for a cosmological constant is along these lines. There's a fixed point at zero for the cosmological constant, and we'll get there only when the universe is so old that the fluctuations die out. And I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. Thank you. P perhaps I should start Sam, with Amit's question. Yeah. He yes, had a question um, about the. Yeah. yeah. So the. I'm sorry? Oh, yes. The acknowledgments. The acknowledgments. Yeah, so these are the people I've discussed with, fluid membranes people and some other friends. Yeah. Yeah. Now the the kind of picture which I would like to suggest for the cosmological constant is that now lambda bar please repeat the Oh yes. Uh, the question is uh, at some point I'd written lambda for the cosmological constant. And Abhay pointed out that it was actually delta lambda which I was talking about. So lambda, sh lambda is really, if you, if you like, lambda is the operator. We should be talking about lambda bar and delta lambda. So the lambda is the average value plus the fluctuation. Yeah? So do I make a distinction between those? Yeah. So what I'm hoping is that the microscopic, will, microscopic theory will produce a kind of lambda which is fluctuating about a mean value which is zero. Yeah? And let's suppose that I start talking about objects like this and take its average, that this will be non-zero and of order one by square root of n. 
It may be that effects like this come out from quantum gravity, where x and x prime are two distinct events in space time. And those are the kind of things one could hope to think of for making observations. That if you could take the quantum action and write down Einstein's action, uh, Einstein's equations, there would be corrections to the equations of motion that are like an effective cosmological constant, but they would be random because they are of quantum and stochastic origin. Yeah? So it may be that the expansion of the universe is actually of this kind. Now there's a problem here because the expansion of universe has a definite sign and the fluctuations seem to be of either sign. So even there, there is a hope that the answer may come along the following lines, that all over the universe, if you have fluctuations of arbitrary sign all over the place, the parts which have got positive lambda will accelerate and dominate over the rest of the parts, and the residual part is positive. That's a hope that we have, but it has not been borne out by any calculation. But still, I mean, if you take this point of view, then lambda is not really constant. Yes, yes. Lambda is really something local. So I think it will have, and also, if you really want to tie it down to the volume, as Raphael did, then that means that this constant is actually in, enormously large in the early universe. And that would have real observational calculation yeah, yeah, consequences. Yeah. And That's right. So th there is a, this, uh, this fluctuation would be large. The, what, what we would hope is that the fluctuation is, well, the, the average value is supposed to be zero, but the fluctuation gets larger in the past because the universe gets smaller and smaller. Right, but, yeah, but that's correct. But, but your left uh, column says that the sort of effective lambda is really lambda bar plus delta lambda. Yes. So therefore, if the fluctuation becomes large, then effectively at, in the early universe, it should be, I mean, not even that early, but uh, it, it would be, uh, it would be very large. Yeah, yeah. And that, so, I think, is Yeah. So, so, so let me state my uh, case again. Yeah. So what I want to do is to put together some very simple and generic ideas together. Okay? I've used an analogy which everybody will ag agree is physically motivated, and I've come up with a small body of ideas. And what I would like to do is to confront this body of ideas with experiment. Huh? So suppose I carry out any of these things, and I actually find that the model is ruled out. That will be really wonderful, because it means that one of these ideas must be wrong. Okay? So it would be wonderful if one can actually rule it out. But in order to rule it out effectively, one has to have a good model, one model that can make theoretical predictions. Yeah? So that's the part where we are stuck. And in fact, I would love it if people from the quantum gravity community try to rule it out in, in that sense of the term. So in order for the exercise to be fruitful, one must have a simple body of ideas which can actually produce a contradiction with experiment. Now, it's not it is inadequate to take this body of ideas and add something else, other things which may or may not be true, and then look for a contradiction. Because for, for, to give you an example, there are inter, interpretational pro, problems with doing quantum cosmology. Hmm? And if you put in the idea of, say, uh, Copenhagen interpretation or something like that, as something on top of all this, then you will definitely not be able to make a simple prediction. Here what I'm taking is a very semi-classical point of view. And if something goes wrong with the predictions that come out of this model, I will know this model is false, that there's something wrong. Yeah? So I, I, I would be really happy if it's ruled out. Let me put it that way. From what I understood from your papers in this talk, yeah. is that you, when you say fluctuations, you're an ensemble of so, uh, fluid membranes. Okay? No, I take a single fluid membrane, and I can measure the flux. In fact, that's what we did in the simulation. I at can, different times. At so different times, yes. But there is no, how can you make such a model for a universe? Yeah, so even in the, in the case of the universe, if you talk about an ensemble of universes, that will be a statement that is not subject to any kind of experimental test. I would rather think about it as a single universe with fluctuations that depend on space and time. That is not the measured cosmological constant, is it? Um, it see, it could be that the measured cosmological constant is a residue, an average over everything. Oh, you said that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I should also clarify that a uh, positive cosmological constant fluctuation respects energy conditions, a negative one does not. Hmm? But a negative, cos I mean, the, these are all quantum fluctuations, so one does not expect energy conditions to be, to be respected. So theoretically, there's no obstacle to having both positive and negative fluctuations. Uh, just, just a minute, perhaps somebody from the back, after, I'll come back to you. Consistent with that, in the sense that, the, see, the cosmological constant problem arose precisely because of that argument of Zeldovich. Right. Huh? Right. Yeah? And once, before that, Einstein was, well, Einstein made two mistakes in his life. One is 
He put in the cosmological constant, and the second is he took it out. And both were done for insufficient reason. Yeah. So Zeldovich showed that you cannot take it out. It's there to stay. And that's exactly the problem we're talking about now. And it's hoped that the quantum gravity will actually address this problem by finding mechanisms to cancel this large infinity from the quantum gravity side and leaving a small residue that we are seeing. So if you push this analogy further, do you have objects like black holes in membranes? Uh, no, no, because yeah, uh, because black holes need a causal structure. And in, there was no causal structure on the membrane side. No? So the whole anal analogy should be taken at the level of mathematical physics. Whenever you can see what's on the other side, you use it. Whenever you can't, sometimes you learn something. For example, the fact that there was no Poisson statistics in the membranes helped us to understand that it was not necessary in the universe side right. as well. Buddy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You could, in, in the universe, I see no obstacle to having a, bud, a universe bud out and go away. Yeah, I don't see any problem with that. Though I don't know how we would be able to keep track of what went on there. Yeah. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, let us thank Sam for a very intriguing lecture. And we thank all the...